Good. Good, the recording is starting. So again, welcome to the workshop. Uh, today I would like to present uh, some principles, tools and applications uh, from open science um, from the perspective of uh, a researcher. Uh, so in particular, I want to first convince you that uh, it is important to be open in our research process, which I think this audience doesn't need a lot of convincing. And secondly, I want to introduce you to some tools that you can apply easily uh, in your own research. So this is an overview of today's topics that I have prepared. Um, it's quite a lot of material. I'm not sure if we will go through everything. So actually I've prepared a little poll like with each of the uh, topics that you see, uh, which topics you are most interested in. So then I will go in order of uh, preference. Do you see the poll now? Yes, I see one vote. So um, I think you can choose several options as well. At least that's how I try to set it up. I'll make a note to myself. Uh, it's been running for one minute. Uh, I will just uh, write down the order in which people selected them and then I will bear this in mind as I go along. Uh, working reproducibly. So does anybody still have a strong opinion? Ah, oh, well, 13, 13 have voted now, so uh, good. I will bear this in, in mind. I will swap the order of the slides uh, in accordance with, uh, with your preferences. However, I will actually start with the why do we need open science because uh, everything else that I say kind of builds on that. So, uh, I have set up this etherpad, which I will just quickly show you how it works. Um, so, uh, now I need to figure out how to do it with my two screens. Uh, can you see the, uh, the browser with the etherpad? I will post the link in the chat. Ah, sorry, the screen is still uh, new, so uh, <laughs> good. So the idea is that uh, each and every one of you should be able to access this etherpad and it's a way to uh, communicate. So I have already written down um, a couple of questions that, um, uh, well, that I, I'm asking throughout the slides. Feel free also to uh, write any comments or questions that you have here. If for whatever reason you don't want to write them in the chat, it's kind of a nice parallel tool to, to Zoom. Good, then I will get back to my slides. Uh, so yes, that's the link to the etherpad. Feel free to uh, check out the chat as well if you want to access it throughout the talk. And before I go into the content, just a couple of words about myself. I am currently a postdoctoral researcher. Uh, my, uh, well, my uh, day job, so to say, is, uh, is a cognitive psychologist. My research interests are reading and dyslexia from a cognitive perspective. And uh, as one of my uh, interests here, or one of the points about myself, I wrote that I'm interested in going, doing good research. 
which might seem like a bit of a strange thing to uh, write because I guess all of us want to do good research, all of us want to do a good job at whatever it is that we are doing. Uh, but actually throughout my research career, since my PhD times, I have started uh, becoming more and more convinced that uh, if we want to good, do good research, we really need to do it openly. So uh, throughout the years, I have become more and more involved in the open science community. Uh, I regularly do workshops and seminars, such as the one today. I am an alumnus of the um, Freies Wissen program, so I participated in the 2018-19 cohort. I'm also an ambassador for the Center of Open Science, which is something I will, I will talk about the Center of Open Science uh, uh, later. Uh, I also, uh, well, try to encourage uh, journal editors to uh, start getting, uh, to, 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 to uh, start offering the registered report publication format for their journals. And of course, I try to incorporate um, open science in my own research workflow. And I will give you a couple of uh, hints and uh, tips about how that is, uh, so what works for me and what doesn't. So, um, Open science is a very broad concept. I think in this audience, everybody has thought a lot about what is open science, what does it mean for them? And probably if I asked each and every one of you, I would get a different answer from every single person. So there are many different aspects. Uh, open science, it's, it's often said that it's an umbrella term. Um, what I will focus on today is this open research workflow, just because that's the topic of the, of the workshop. Um, but of course, there are other aspects, uh, things like citizen science and open education. So uh, in addition to the uh, poll that I did and to try out this uh, Etherpad tool, I just have this uh, quick question here. Uh, which aspects of open science would you like to learn more about? So now is the time to try out the Etherpad tool. So. Yeah, let's just spend a couple of minutes. You can uh, kind of write down your questions. Open educational resources. Um, yes. So by the way, you can either be remain anonymous in the uh, etherpad or uh, write your name next to the color that you have. So it's up to you. I've named myself. <laughs> but yes, so I saw uh, somebody new has joined. So I will just quickly post the link to the chat again. So it's the link to the Etherpad where you can, uh, well, we are now uh, uh, writing. Uh, an answer to the question, what aspects of open science would you like to learn more about? Yes, so I need to warn you that I, I haven't prepared materials for all of the questions that are being listed so far, but uh, a lot of these I will talk more about. So uh, I will talk about fair open data open access database, uh, not directly, unfortunately. Yes, so, um, there are a couple of points now, so um, uh, thank you for <laughs> for your answers. I will try to bear this in in mind um, and to uh, spend more time on the topics that you are interested in. So now I need to figure out how to get back to my slides. Do you see them now again?
Yes, good. <laughs> So I really want to, uh, well, tell you more about why I think we need open science. As I've already uh, told you, I think that openness is very important if we want to do good research. And of course, the question is, what is good research? And I should say now uh, that, of course, openness is not the only thing that we need in order for research to be good. But I would argue that we need openness, so it's necessary, but not sufficient. So uh, one definition of good research that I came up with uh, is doing the same thing over and over again and getting the same or at least similar results, uh, which is, of course, not a really technical definition. But I think it's, it's something that we should strive towards. Uh, if you think about something like medical research, it's obvious why. If, if we do a treatment study and we find that this treatment is effective, but then we do it again and we find that actually it's harmful, then we don't really want to base our decisions uh, based on such research. And there are two things that we need in order for, for this kind of end state. The first one is that if we have a published paper, we are able to repeat the procedure. So we have enough information to understand what did the authors actually do. And secondly, whatever is reported in the paper, ideally should reflect some kind of systematic pattern. So if we find that uh, the treatment is effective, it should reflect the fact that the uh, treatment is actually effective and not, for example, just that in the treatment uh, or in the control group there happened to be a person who uh, got much worse for completely unrelated reasons. So both of these need to be met. Question is, are they met? So uh, the first condition is referred to as reproducibility. Uh, from the perspective of mathematics, for example, or uh, computer science, Reproducibility means that you really take the information presented in the paper, for example, the calculations in a mathematics paper, you do the same cal calculations on pen and with your pen and paper and you get the same numbers. Uh, so that's reproducibility. And the question is, do we have a problem with this? So is the research literature as it is at the moment reproducible? And I would say it's not, because uh, it's already in the name. A publication is normally an article. An article is most often behind a paywall. So anyone who doesn't have access to uh, the journals, who doesn't have uh, access to a university library, for example, already cannot reproduce this research. But even if you have access, uh, I drew this picture here, which you can also reuse if you like. I, I'm actually a really bad drawer, so I'm, I'm really proud of this. So the publication is this article that comes out at the end. It's normally like 10 pages or so. It's, it's uh, really short and um, it's supposed to summarize the research process, which is actually really extensive. So we start off with a researcher who has an idea. The researcher has uh, then sits down, starts writing, stupid things happen. She pours coffee over her manuscript by accident. Uh, she runs the experiment. Uh, three times she gets uh, the same result. Once she gets something else and then she breaks a test tube. Uh, there is a computer with, um, uh, uh, with scripts, with data, with manuscripts. And uh, there are a lot of things that just don't work out. Uh, somebody wrote in the chat, beautiful, and I like your drawing, thank you. <laughs> so um, a lot of these things just don't make it to the paper, especially if we take this example, we have um, five experiments, basically. And if you take only the three that actually worked, then the story goes like this. We did the experiment three times and we found the same result, which is actually a really strong case. But if the, if the, the full story is known, then it goes differently. Then it's like we did the experiment five times, three times we got the same result, but once we didn't and once we broke a test tube, so we actually don't know. So that's already a very different case and somebody 
reading the article would already come to a very different conclusion. So uh, I would argue that it is problematic that um, a lot of the information does not make it to the paper and that means that a lot of the steps are not reproducible because nobody knows about them. Um, in the video that I recorded uh, that was sent around, I think, uh, last week, uh, I have already talked about replication versus reproducibility. So I don't want to talk about the replication crisis too much. Um, basically, with replication, you take a different sample and you implement the same experimental procedure and say, see if you get a similar result. Uh, I think there is a good case that uh, there is a replication crisis. Uh, this is a figure from a Nature paper, which included a survey of uh, one and a half thousand scientists who were asked uh, whether they have ever tried and failed to repro uh, well, replicate an experiment confusingly. Here they call it reproduce, uh, but these terms are confusingly used interchangeably some, uh, sometimes. So uh, across very different fields, fields, including also physics and engineering, uh, normally more than half of the researchers have uh, indicated that they have uh, not been able to uh, replicate uh, either somebody else's or their own results. So this is a, also problematic. And in psychology, this replication crisis is a really big thing. I think a couple of you are from psychology, but I have tried very hard to make the slides broadly applicable. So um, um, in psychology, there, uh, this realization that we have a problem with uh, replicability has really uh, sparked an existential crisis. So a lot of researchers have, have started asking why this is the case. And uh, the, uh, the reasons for that are actually very well known. So um, there are these four so-called horsemen of uh, repro the, the reproducibility crisis, as they were ter termed by Dorothy Bishop. Hypothesizing after results are known, low statistical power, p-hacking and publication bias. So I would like to ask you to do a show of hands. Who of you uses p-values or knows what they are because um, yeah, you can use the chat window. So three people so far. Uh, yes, so only three people use p-values. Good, then I will uh, make sure that I don't rely on the p-values uh, logic too much. Uh, and that I uh, state things in a broader way. So low statistical power and p-hacking are kind of specific to p-values, but uh, if you take the concepts from a broader perspective, they are also relevant to uh, other approaches. So basically in combination, and that is something that can be shown uh, mathematically, all of this increases the probability that if we have a paper that states that they did find a significant effect, that there is, for example, a treatment effect in medicine, that this actually does not reflect a true effect, but more random noise. So, publication bias is something that applies to everyone. Uh, um, although uh, I defined it here in terms of p-values, so basically, uh, with publication bias, you publish only significant results. So again, in the case of uh, um, a treatment study in medicine, if you find a significant improvement, which is normally defined by finding a p-value smaller than 0 0.05, then you conclude that the treatment is effective. And the problem is that it is often more difficult to publish papers if the result is not significant. Journals might say that uh, the negative result is just boring. Why would we want to publish something about a treatment that doesn't work? 
And especially if it's a replication of a different study, uh, researchers might um, kind of, uh, well, the journals might say that that's just a replication. It's not even new and it's a negative result. Why would we ever publish that? And also from the side of the researchers, uh, there's also uh, often reluctance to um, spend too much time trying to publish a negative result and um, rather researchers prefer to drop the study like a hot potato and move on to another study which will give them uh, well uh, uh, better results and more significant p-values. So just uh, as a formal definition of the p-value, um, it's the uh, statistic that psychologists and some other fields use to uh, draw conclusions about uh, from their data. So if the p-value is smaller than 0 0.05, they say that the result is significant or positive. Uh, and the conclusion is then that the effect is there. Uh, whereas uh, when it's not significant, when it's larger than 0 0.05, we don't really know what to conclude. So statistical power is something that is problematic, especially in conjunction with, uh, uh, with uh, publication bias, and I really want to explain to you why. This is going to be the densest part of the workshop, so um, uh, I hope I won't lose too many of you, but I think it's very important to make this very clear, and that will also uh, uh, really bring across the point, I think, why we need open science. So I will focus on the informal explanation of what statistical power is. So for the formal explanation, you can, you can look um, at the definition above. So it's kind of like a magnifying glass. Uh, if you think about um, uh, biology as an example, so I know nothing about biology, so probably if there are any biologists in the audience, uh, uh, they might not <laughs> agree with me, but as a biologist, you might be studying very small organisms, you might be studying bacteria or viruses, or you might be studying big organisms like uh, elephants, for example. And if you are studying viruses, then you need a very, very strong uh, microscope in order to be able to see them. Whereas if you are uh, studying elephants, then, then you don't, then you just look at them and you see them. And uh, statistical power is kind of like how strong the magnifying glass is. And if we have low statistical power, then we have a low chance of detecting something that is there. Uh, and um, there are several things that determine how strong the magnifying glass needs to be. So uh, if we, uh, the size of an object is, is an obvious one. If we uh, have something really small, then we need a strong magnifying glass or a, or a microscope. But also how, how noisy is the signal? So if you are looking uh, at a bacteria in distilled water, for example, you will be, it will be easier for you to detect it than if you are looking for a bacterium of a particular type among bacteria of different types. So um, if your power is small, if you're looking at noisy data, or if the effect that you are looking at is very small, then it's kind of like uh, trying to find some uh, bacterium with your grandmother's reading glasses. And we actually know that in psychological science, at least, statistical power is very low. It's, it's about 50%. So if the effect is actually there, we are still running about 50% chance of not seeing it. So why is this problematic? I've got, um, uh, well, a schematic uh, depiction of this. So here we have an example, we have 30 studies. So let's say 30 researchers all over the world are interested in a particular effect, in a, for example, in the effect of a particular drug, whether it's beneficial or not. So all 30 labs run one study, uh, everything is identical, the treatment is identical, the number of participants is identical, and um, the statistical power is 50%, which uh, normally we don't know in the real world, but this is a hypothetical example, so I just say the power, the statistical power is 15%. So if these 
30 labs run their 30 studies, so one each. Then uh, by the def definition of power, we expect that about 15 of them will get a significant result and 15 will not. So the green squares are the studies with a significant result and the blue ones are the ones with a non-significant result. Does this make sense so far? Yes, so please feel free to interrupt me with questions at any time. Good, so um, this kind of depiction shows us which labs found that the effect is there and which ones didn't. But what we are often interested in is how strong is this effect? Because that will really allow us to compare it to other drugs in, in this example. So to do that, we calculate an uh, observed effect size. So uh, we take the outcome variable of interest, for example, if this drug is supposed to uh, improve um, depression symptoms and in, in symptoms with depression, then we calculate the difference in the improvement or the, the difference between the control and the uh, treatment group. And the size of the observed effect will vary because we do have uh, some, some random variability. Not everybody will show the same improvement. And if we plot a histogram of how much people improved in the treatment relative to the control group, we will most likely get a normal distribution. So uh, most participants or most studies will show effect sizes that are kind of close to some uh, real population effect, but there will be some variability. Some people will have uh, some uh, high improvers in the control group just by, by chance and others will have uh, particularly high improvers in the treatment group. So because everything about these studies is the same in our hypothetical example, uh, the half of the studies which has a significant effect will have a higher observed effect size than the ones from the, that, that got the non-significant result. What does this mean in conjunction with publication bias? This means that all of these studies will be thrown out. They will not be published because they are not significant. So if somebody wants to do a meta-analysis, so they want to look at all studies that are available and see how big is the effect, they will rely on this half only. So uh, in a meta-analysis, uh, basically you calculate an average effect size from all the available studies, which in this case will be somewhere around here probably. So you will get an overestimated effect size which is really not good because, uh, well, <laughs> then you get a completely wrong conclusion. So you will still conclude that the effect is there, but you will overestimate how big it is. So now let's think about what happens when the effect is not there. So let's say that, again, our 30 labs are studying a treatment effect. And uh, uh, we happen to know because we created this hypothetical example that the effect is actually not there. Uh, here you need to know the definition of the p-value because the p-value assumes that the effect is not there and gives you the probability that you will get a significant result anyway. So this is a bit counterintuitive. This is, I think, what, where a lot of the misconceptions about the p-value come from. You can get a significant effect if the effect is not there, but this is fixed by the way that it is calculated to 5%. So again, we have our 30 studies and we expect 5% of these studies to have significant effects, uh, which in this case is 1.5. Uh, I rounded it up to two here. And uh, if we plot the observed effect sizes, we should get something like this. So the peak here should be at zero exactly because the effect is not there. And we get a couple of outlier experiments which show a significant effect because this is expected to happen by the definition of the p-value. 
So in this case, actually, it's even worse than in the previous one because all of these studies get put in the file drawer. And if somebody wants to uh, draw some conclusions only from these two studies that are published, they don't know about the existence of the non-significant studies if there is publication bias. So they will say, okay, there are two studies on this treatment effect and both show that there is an effect and that it is quite big. So they will conclude that there is consistent evidence for the benefit of this treatment, even though if we see the full picture, we see that that's not actually the case at all. Is, is this clear up till here or are there any questions? Good, so um, that was kind of the densest part. <laughs> So uh, now I will talk a bit uh, about the, so we've covered from the four horsemen, um, publication bias and low statistical power. And the other two are p-hacking and harking, which we uh, will cover uh, now. Um, so if you want to know more about how p-hacking works, I recommend that you check out this link. Uh, you will have the slides later on. So you can uh, have a look at the links uh, in your own time. Uh, I already gave you the definition of the p-value. So if the effect is not there, then we get a significant effect 5% of the time. So even though we sometimes get the wrong answer, this is a, a feature and not a bug because this is really what the p-value was designed to do. It gives you the long run probability of making an error. P-hacking is a set of practices that we can use to um, drive up this, well, artificially increase our chances of getting a significant p-value. So again, we are assuming that an effect doesn't exist. And some simulations described by Simonson and colleagues uh, in a nice paper called False Positive Psychology showed that with p-hacking you can get a false positive rate of up to uh, 60 percent. So if you run an experiment, the effect is not actually there, you have still a better chance of squeezing a significant result out of it than you have uh, of guessing the outcome of a coin toss correctly. So what is p-hacking and what are some examples of that? Uh, it's something that most people do without realizing that they are doing something wrong. Uh, a lot of it stems from misunderstandings about what the p-value actually means. Here are some examples. And quite often, if people are taught, for example, in psychology undergraduate degrees, that p-hacking is bad, they are given a list like this without really understanding why this is wrong. So optional stopping, for example, it means that for example, you test 20 participants. You see if your effect is there in these 20 participants. If it is, if the effect is significant, if the p-value is smaller than 0 0.05, then you stop testing and you report it as a significant result. If not, you test another 10 participants and calculate the p-value again. Again, if it's not significant, you continue testing, etc which uh, just completely intuitively makes perfect sense because let's say you get a p-value of 0 0.08. A good researcher relying on their intuition will say that um, this means that we don't have enough data. We need to have more data to have a stronger signal to noise ratio, uh, to have more, more, more data, to have more information. So it is completely counterintuitive when somebody comes and tells them, actually, that's p-hacking and that's really bad. But I think a better way to kind of explain on a more intuitive level why p-hacking is bad and um, more importantly, what it even is, what constitutes p-hacking, uh, so um, I think if we rely on an analogy, it's much more intuitive to understand what it actually, what p-hacking actually is. The analogy is um, tossing a coin and predicting the outcome. Because the p-value and the outcome of a coin toss are both random variables, so they follow the same laws of probability. 
with uh, tossing a coin, of course, you, you know, if I say I can predict the outcome of a coin toss, and I toss the coin and I uh, indeed guess correctly, I have a 50% chance of doing that. So I will sometimes be right, I will sometimes be wrong. This is just something that, that all of you are, I'm sure, familiar with. So let's say I make a very bold claim and I will say that I have some clairvoyant powers, I can predict the future. And if I toss a coin five times, I will always predict the correct outcome. So that's kind of like making a hypothesis. I will run this experiment and I will get a significant p-value. And in this case, the claim is quite ridiculous. I think you will be very skeptical that I, uh, can, that I can actually do this. Five times is already like the probability of that is not that high. So if indeed I can do that, you will probably start wondering what's wrong with the coin. But uh, if I can convince you that there is nothing wrong with the coin, then probably you will start kind of thinking, okay, maybe there is something to her claim. So um, there are a couple of things that I do th that I can do that are analogous to p-hacking that will already make it very clear why I'm cheating. So let's say I tell you that I will toss the coin until I guess correctly five times in a row. So it might take me a very long time. I might have to throw it several hundred times, but definitely at some stage there will be a time when I will throw the when, when I will make a guess, throw the coin, and it will be correct five times in a row. And it's the same with the p-value with this with this optional stopping scenario that I told you about. That if we continue to collect more participants calculating a p-value, collecting more participants, we are guaranteed at some stage to get a significant p-value at some stage. It might take a long time again, but uh, definitely you have a very good chance of this happening. Another way of p-hacking is to look at the p-value and then if the result is not significant, discard some participants or experiments which is similar to um, in the coin, uh, in, sorry, in the coin tossing example to saying, okay, I guessed wrong now, but this doesn't count, I'm just warming up. So this is something uh, where in the case of experiments, uh, quite often there is a very good reason uh, and people are really good at convincing themselves that there is a good reason, but for this reason, it's a very slippery slope and definitely the decision to include or exclude participants or experiments should never depend on the p-value. Another way of p-hacking is to do a subgroup analysis. So um, let's say you do your treatment study, then you see, you check whether uh, the, you don't find the effect, so you check whether the effect is present only in men or only in women or only in older participants or younger participants. And again, if you split the sample up and calculate a lot of different p-values, then eventually you will find a significant p-value. And it's the same as uh, trying to find some conditions that explain why I only guess the outcome correctly sometimes and not at other times. The other uh, way to cheat is to uh, switch the um, outcome variable. So let's say you are running an intervention on IQ and um, your intervention is supposed to increase IQ and just in case you gave the participants five different IQ tasks. So there is one that you expect to be the best. So you originally plan to analyze that, but then you don't find a significant result and then you switch to another variable. So I said at the beginning that I will toss the coin five times and I'll always predict the outcome, but maybe I'll find that I guessed only four out of five times correctly. And then I can say, okay, even though the initial hypothesis didn't work, this is still higher than chance, this is still bigger than 2.5, so I still win. And harking is a very nice example because uh, this is something that, so basically, uh, Harking stands for hypothesizing after results are known. It's, it's the last of the four horsemen. So it's technically not p-hacking, but it's a similar principle and also falls under the coin tossing analogy. 
So basically, uh, with Hawking, you first come up with a hypothesis, you run your experiment to confirm the hypothesis, and if the experiment does not confirm the hypothesis, then you come up with a completely different hypothesis. So in the case of the coin tossing example, uh, I might uh, be tossing my coin. I don't guess correctly uh, all the time. And then I say, well, okay, that didn't work, but a car just drove past, so I have a completely new hypothesis. Whenever I toss a coin, this causes cars to pass by my window, which is completely ridiculous. And if I started a new experiment and actually tested that, I would most likely not get evidence for that. But if I sell that as the whole story, if I say that that was my hypothesis to begin with, and uh, uh, indeed I did the experiment and found support for it, then it's a completely different story than if I make it clear that this is just the post hoc hypothesis that I came up with after the original one didn't work out. Okay, so these are the four horsemen of the reproducibility crisis. Um, that's kind of the biggest section, uh, the more, most dense section of this workshop. So uh, thank you for bearing with me so far. Here is just a, a little cartoon to uh, drive home the message. And uh, now I have uh, planned in some time for questions, comments, or if you like, I mean, we have two hours, we can take a five minute break if people like. Does anybody have any preferences? I've got the link to the etherpad again, so uh, people can ask questions either um, uh, yeah, either in the chat or in the etherpad. Hang on, I will open the chat again. I closed it by accident. Yeah, so somebody is for a short break. Uh, somebody is against a short break. Um, yeah, so how about a compromise, a two minute break? Question about qual qualitative research. Um, so would it be okay to have a two minute break until 3.50? And then we can discuss the question. In the meantime, people can post also their questions. And uh, yeah, good. Good then, see you in two minutes.
Okay, so uh, two min minutes are up. I hope you had time to get your coffee. Um, so for questions, I see only the one in the chat. Um, hang on now, I need to check also where the video panel went. Hmm. <laughs> um, so I see the question about uh, qualitative research. Uh, there are a lot to, of things to say about that. Um, I still can't find the video panel somehow. Ah, here it is. Okay. <laughs> Good, so um, in relation to um, the four horsemen of the replica, uh, replica, uh, replication crisis, I would say that uh, publication bias is something that definitely apl applies because if you collect qualitative data, then most of the time I think uh, people still have some kind of hypotheses that they want to, well, probably because people have egos, they want to, um, confirm their own hypothesis and it is still possible to kind of not publish data that doesn't uh, really confirm your hypothesis um, but of course the things about p-hacking uh, in in that in that particular context don't really apply so does this answer the question or are there is there something more specific I must say, I, I don't actually have um, much information about qualitative research. My own research is purely quantitative. So I know that there are some uh, fellows from the previous year. Um, I'm really bad with names. I Isabel, I can't think of her last name right now. I know she has worked a lot. Steinhardt. Uh, Steinhardt. Isabel yeah. Steinhardt. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. So she has uh, done a lot of work. For, she is a sociologist. So um, yeah, maybe you can, you can, uh, oh, is uh, Zara still here? <laughs> uh, yes. So maybe that could be another idea for a workshop to invite her to talk about this. Because honestly, I, I can't say, say that much about this. So any other questions or should we continue? So um, yeah, um, one of the topics that you wanted to know most about is open science in action, which is actually the last topic chronologically. So let me find the relative slide, uh, relevant slides. Uh, there we go. Yes, so the reason why I included the, uh, this section is that a lot of the times um, when people walk out of workshops or talks like this, they uh, come out feeling very pessimistic because a lot of the time the focus is on the things that are wrong uh, and the things that are not going well. But I think actually there is cause of, for optimism. So I personally started my doing PhD, uh, I personally started doing my PhD in 2011. And um, the whole replication crisis and awareness only just really started to emerge at that time. So um, a lot of things have already changed. A lot of things are improving. People are becoming more and more aware of the issues and also thinking about solutions. So even though, um, well, this is a blog post that was published still in 2016, um, which suggested that everything is effed <laughs> in, in psychological science. So it's actually a really nice blog post with a reading list. But that's not the feeling that I want you to uh, walk, walk away with. 
So this slide is something that uh, I have uh, taken from uh, well, uh, a similar workshop that I did for uh, my master students. Uh, what I would like them to take away from, from this workshop in particular um, is when you do hear about a research finding to be healthily skeptical. So I think the audience is, is very, very broad, very varied. Probably the things that I said about p-values will not be applicable directly to your own research for those of you who do qualitative research, for example. But I think it's still very important and that's why I really wanted to do this. Uh, why do we need uh, open science uh, section? Because uh, no matter where you go, what you read, if you hear about some, some new diet or some new treatment, this stuff is really relevant. Like understanding how it can go wrong is very important if you want to evaluate uh, research that has an impact on your everyday life. So when you hear about some new treatment of some kind, my recommendation would be to be healthily skeptical uh, for um, your own research. Um, I would, re well, I recommend it to my master students. I'm not sure if it's really relevant uh, to <laughs> any of you, but I guess at some stage, if you are in your PhD or in your postdoc, you will be uh, looking for a topic for your follow-up postdoc or your, for your first postdoc. So consider if the topic that you are building on, if the literature that is behind it is reliable. And there are some kind of fields of reliable studies that have been replicated again and again and again, in which case everything is fine. But if things are a bit unclear, I would recommend either to pick a different topic or to start from square one. So really start with the basic effects, see if you can replicate them. And my personal advice would be actually just, this is quite cynical, but just do something else because you will only make enemies by, uh, uh, well, going up to a prof and saying, uh, actually your research sucks, I can't replicate it. But what I don't want you to go away with, as I said, is uh, the idea that all research is bad. That's definitely not the case. And the good things, um, the good things about this, uh, about the, op the replication crisis is that firstly, we do have uh, opportunities to really do research that we can trust. So now that we know all the things that are going wrong, we also know how we can also uh, get some information about how to uh, get better results that we can trust more. And also because we know that a lot of the things that ha we have been doing for, for decades or maybe even centuries are wrong, it also encourages us to try out new things and to really think outside of the box. So I've got a couple of examples of open science uh, projects, uh, which I think also some of them will uh, go in the direction of the things that you wrote in the etherpad. The first is an open collaborative writing project. So this example is by Christoph Molner, who is a PhD student at uh, my university, at the uh, Ludwig Maximilians uh, University in Munich. Uh, he's a statistician and as part of his PhD, he wrote a textbook on interpretable machine learning. The way he wrote it was fully collaborative. So he started writing it and he straight away invited other people to contribute. So he wrote all of this in uh, Git, uh, or back this up in, in Git, and uh, everybody was able to modify their document, to add things, to fix any mistakes, uh, to add ideas, etc. So this is the first example. Second example is a uh, crowd source uh, is uh, uh, about um, citizen involvement in uh, science. So this is actually two projects. So it started off with a project called uh, Tell Us. 
Uh, I think I can go to the page. It's probably actually no longer working. So uh, in this, uh, on this website, people were able to um, uh, give input about the research questions that they would like to see addressed by research. So um, uh, people uh, were recruited, there, there was a lot of advertisement for this project and they wrote their ideas. Okay, this is a health related question where I really don't know what to do. There really doesn't seem to be a lot of research. Of course, experts were um, uh, asked as well, but mainly it was really about finding out in the general public um, where is there need for more research? And indeed, it, um, uh, one project emerged from that. So there seemed to be a lot of uh, need for uh, more research on supporting uh, children of parents with mental illness. So this is an Austrian project. I think this is in particular uh, uh, specific to children uh, or well families in uh, regional areas. So that's why the project was called the Village Project. And uh, indeed, uh, then they started a study and they started really investigating this because they used this citizen science approach to find the gap, uh, a research gap. So the third example is a living systematic review. Um, uh, you can find it on this web page, University uh, BE, I guess, I think that's Bern. And the idea is that you do a systematic review, so on this very uh, important topic, uh, the Zika virus, and you automatize the process of the systematic review. So you write a script that automatically finds papers so that continuously scans the databases which have the papers that have preprints automatically removes dupl duplicates, I think also extracts some statistics that are relevant. And that way you can really continuously update uh, the information. Uh, a lot of it is also described on this page and um, uh, when they publish any results from these analyses, they publish them always in open access journals. So I tried to pick uh, three examples that are very different to each other. Um, when I was preparing these slides, uh, well, the original version of these slides for, for my students, I wrote on Twitter and I asked if somebody had any ha happy open science thoughts. So uh, some examples of um, open science in action where it really has led to some breakthrough. Uh, so if you ever feel pessimistic uh, about the state of science, uh, you can always uh, find my slides and click on this link. So this is the tweet that I wrote about this and all the responses to that, which I couldn't incorporate uh, fully, <laughs> uh, you can see is the responses to this tweet. Okay, so that's the uh, part on open science in action. Are there any questions on this or some discussion points, follow up, uh, follow up questions? I will quickly go to the etherpad. Okay, no questions so far. So I would move on to the next most popular topic, which I wrote down was open research workflow. So I will just continue going through the topics until we run out of time. So um, uh, with this kind of workshop, um, yeah, uh, I think here's where it starts. Uh, I think it's very beneficial to everyone if if it's kind of interactive, if you interrupt me to ask questions, so it's not just me groaning on for two hours. So um, feel free to raise any discussion points. 
at any time. Uh, and I will just continue going through the topics until we run out of time, if uh, that's fine with everyone. Good, so uh, the open research workflow is the next thing that I wanted to talk about. And I, uh, well, I have mentioned uh, in my introductory slide that I am an ambassador for the Center of Open Science. Uh, which sounds very impressive. It's actually not, not that difficult to become, become an ambassador for the Center of Open Science. All you need is, to do is to write to them to have an introduction via, via uh, Skype. Oh, I think it was Skype back then when I joined, probably Zoom by now. And then you are listed on the uh, website of the Center for Open Science. You get access to some resources although I think these resources are all open access, so you can access them anyway uh, and reuse them uh, with attribution. Um, and the Center of Open Science runs the Open Science Framework. So maybe a quick show of hands who uh, has heard of the Open Science Framework before, or who uses it. So again, in the participants list, I think you should or actually probably Somewhere in your Zoom window, you should be able to raise your hand. Good, so two hands so far. That's good. Then I will be telling something new to some of you. <laughs> good, so the Open Science Framework is a web page. So uh, here is the link to it. And uh, you can create an account. It's free of charge. The whole web page is completely open source. So if somebody wanted to, they could take the source code and make their own open science framework. And it's a platform that is very good both for collaboration and for sharing materials. So uh, both with your collaborators, hence the collaboration and uh, with, with uh, er anyone in, uh, like with just everyone as part of open science. So here is what a project looks like. So you create an account and you can create a project. Uh, this is one of my project. Uh, you have a title and um, uh, the main, function of the Open Science Framework is that you can upload files. Uh, you can upload files in any format. So this is very good because you can really upload data, you can upload analysis scripts, you can upload preprints, you can upload materials for your experiments or questionnaires or anything that you like, videos, images. And then you can share it. So um, in this particular project, I'm the only contributor because I haven't managed to convince my uh, co-authors to uh, sign up uh, for an account. Uh, but uh, when you create the project and you add contributors, all of your contributors, all of your collaborators are also able to access these files and to upload and to download them. So this is very good because you can share everything between yourselves. Then you can make this project either private or public. So if it's set to private, then only your contributors can see it. Nobody else can. So when you are still working on this, then it's, it's a good, uh, good setting, perhaps, if you don't want people to see your work in progress. If you make it public, then everyone who has the link can access it. So that's the point of, of um, or one of the main points, it makes it really easy just to share everything about your project from every stage of the life of the cycle of the research project. One thing that is very important is that you have a citation. Here I didn't open the window uh, with the citation, but basically there is a link. And this, is, uh, this link is persistent, so that means that there is some guarantee from the Open Science Framework that if you put the link, for example, in a published paper, so a supplementary material, then even if researchers try to access this material 10, 5, uh, 5 10, uh, 20 or 50 years from now, they should be able to 
reach this same page uh, with the exact same link. So this is quite important because I'm sure a lot of you have had the experience that uh, some paper referenced some supplementary material and when you clicked on it, it was a broken link at the author's personal page that they just stopped ma maintaining. So um, this is kind of an open research workflow <laughs> in a nutshell. This is very easy to do because you just throw everything into onto the onto um, the OSF, and you can really share everything. It doesn't take any uh, uh, any uh, particular computer uh, computer skills or um, any money or anything. You just have this at your disposal. Good, so that's actually what I had about the open research workflow. <laughs> Are there any questions about this or any comments? Yeah, being uh, the ambassador of the open science, uh, well, of the Center for Open Science, um, I chose to present the uh, open science framework as a tool that really helps you to make your uh, research workflow open. But of course, there may be other tools that may be more suitable to you. So I'm not trying to religiously convince you that this is the only true way to go. But I think it's a very useful tool just because it is simple and still combines everything at once. So uh, next two topics were working reproducibly and uh, fair data, which had the same amount of votes. So because it's a nice segue from the open research workflow. I think I will continue for now with um, working reproducibly, if, if that's fine with everyone. So the segue is uh, version control, which is also a feature that the open science framework has. So maybe again, a show of hands. Uh, well, maybe I'll reverse the question for now. Oh, who hasn't heard about version control? Who doesn't know what version control is? So please uh, raise your hands. So I see a thumbs up, so both thumbs up or uh, raising your hand in the participants list is, is fine. So two people say they have never heard of uh, version control before. So I will um, go through it and uh, explain what it is. Um, for those of you who already know a bit about it, there, there might be some, some repetition or maybe some new information. So basically the idea with version control is, um, I will maybe show you the next slide first. Uh, the idea with version control is to avoid this problem. <laughs> because uh, you always, for many, many files that you will have. You will um, start with the document, then you will get some contribution from your collaborator, so you will decide by yourself to change something. Then you don't want to overwrite the uh, previous version for whatever reason, because maybe you will change your mind and want to change something back at some stage. So you uh, give it a different name, and it goes on and on and on, and in the end, you have a folder which um, is really full of files that you just don't even know what the most recent version is. So this is where version control comes in. It allows you to keep track of this. And the Open Science Framework actually has a very basic uh, version of, uh, well, a very basic form of version control. The idea is that uh, once you upload a file, it will be on the Open Science Framework. It acts like a Dropbox in that way. And if you upload the new version of the file with the same name, it will replace, so the new version will replace the old version. But the old version will not be deleted or overwritten, rather it will be archived. So if there are several versions of the same document on the Open Science Framework, 
The most recent one is always the one that is being shown by default, but you can go back to the archive versions. So if your collaborator deletes something by accident and uploads the wrong version, or if you decide that the way that you wrote something previously was actually better, you can always go back and change that. And version control, um, I guess for those of you who did hear about that, you may have heard about it more from the, uh, from the world of uh, programmers. Uh, because they use version control for writing code all the time and uh, there they use Git, uh, which is um, uh, something that requires already some technical skills. So um, it's also a good thing to learn and to know about, but um, with the open science framework you can really um, uh, well, <laughs> it's really simple and you don't need any uh, programming skills at all. So uh, this was a uh, still kind of a middle thing between the uh, open research workflow and working reproduci re reproducibly section. So uh, now the re reproducibility section uh, starts. So basically, um, uh, well, ideally, when you publish something, like really publish something as opposed to just uh, publish an article behind a paywall, uh, we also have to distinguish between uh, open as in being somewhere on the web or open in the sense of being accessible and understandable to everyone. So, uh, it's possible to just dump things on the open science framework, which is a complete mess and nobody will be able to make sense of it. Even if you yourself uh, have a look at what you uploaded a couple of months ago, you might not really know what, uh, what, what it really is. So we want to avoid this and I uh, list here a couple of uh, tips and tricks that you can use. So the first thing when I or, uh, one that I already mentioned is when you upload something, make sure that the site has a persistent identifier. For example, a DOI. So actually with the Open Science fr Framework, there is a possibility to create a DOI. There are also some other pages, Synodo, I think, uh, where, you can, uh, where you can do that. Uh, and it's basically a number that will always, always, always be associated to the content that you uploaded. So again, this is something that will avoid having dead links, uh, which can happen if you upload it on your personal website, which you will stop maintaining at some stage. One thing that is always a good idea, but especially if you want to be open, is to be well organized. And this is something that takes effort, <laughs> that doesn't come naturally to, every, to everyone, including myself. But if you invest the effort, then it will pay back a million fold. So version control is one way to be well organized. And uh, once I started using it, I uh, really don't know how I could live before that. So when I go back to the times before I started using version control, I open some folder with, a, with an old project and I just need to spend half an hour or so to figure out which is the most recent version of the file. That's just terrible. So <laughs> version control is something that will save you a lot of um, a lot of time and nerves. Use descriptive file names. So these are like some pretty straightforward things, but I think they are not commonly no known, and they are they can make your life much easier. So if you have uh, fifty different files on your compu computer which are all called data.csv or manuscript.doc, then you will get confused very easily. If you instead say project X manuscript, then it already tells you much more about what it actually is. For those of you who write code, it's always a good idea to comment it. I don't know to how many people this applies. So maybe, uh, I guess to those of you who, to whom it does apply, you, you know what I mean with that. So. I will not comment on that further. 
um, I guess most of you use some kind of software for your research, whether it is for, well, even for things like writing manuscripts. It is always good to choose open source software whenever possible. So maybe with writing manuscripts, it's not the best uh, example because the problem with closed so source, uh, closed source software is that if you have a file and you want to share it with someone and it was created in some super expensive proprietary software, then the other person might not be able to open it. So one example that I always give is SPSS because um, that, that's a program for uh, data analysis and I, from, a, from an open science perspective, it's just a complete disaster. Uh, it costs a lot of money to get the license. If you store your data in the format that uh, SPSS, well, uh, in, in the format that SPSS uses as a default, people can only open the file. They can only open the data file if they have SPSS themselves. And it, it's a very expensive software. It's, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> so whenever possible, use open source software for that reason. Also, another reason to this, well, for me to this on uh, SPSS is um, that it's a pointed click software. So for example, for data analysis, but also for many other things, for manuscripts, for example, uh, you have a software which is more uh, code-based or software where you point and click. So for manuscripts, there is the example of LaTeX for which is code-based. So the formatting you do by writing commands, uh, whereas in SPSS, you highlight and click on the italics button, for example, uh, in uh, Microsoft Word, you highlight and click on the italics button. So, um, it's always good to use code-based software because that way you um, can always, in retrospect, see exactly what you did and where and why and how. So with data analysis, for example, if you use SPSS, you manually delete some outliers, let's say. You transform some variables and then you just save your data file and close it and you come back five months later. Unless you recorded it in a separate file or saved the syntax, you have no idea, you have no way to find out what you did five months ago. So you don't, if you don't remember how you excluded the participants or you didn't write it down, you just don't know. Whereas in R, you will write a code, a piece of code saying if uh, that Z score of that particular participant is greater than that and that much, exclude that participant. So you will really have the written uh, record of what you did. With working reproducibly, there are a lot of things that you can do. Uh, a lot of the things that I mentioned on this slide already require quite a lot of uh, technical skills. So um, it might come off as a bit uh, intimidating, but I think it's really uh, a really good approach is to start with one small step at a time. So you don't have to uh, drop everything that you are doing to learn Git version control in Git and uh, programming in R. But if you can t take one small step at a time, maybe try out one of the things uh, this week, another thing next week, uh, then eventually you will get there and any little step already is uh, very, very helpful to the open science spirit. And the thing about working reproducibly is that uh, it is good from an open science perspective because you are really making your work available to other people. You are really making the whole research process transparent so other people can build on it and really understand what you did. But first and foremost, it's also something that is very good for yourself. For your future self when you try to go back to a project that you started uh, a while ago and that you are trying to uh, finish. 
Okay, so any questions or comments at this stage? And I will check. So, yes, I think no questions so far. So the next topic is actually um, fair data, which is also the next uh, popular one. Uh, no, actually, that's uh, the open access. Yeah, there we go, fair data. So um, FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, the reason why it's called FAIR data and not open data is that, uh, well, open data sounds very scary. So um, whenever people start talking about open data, understandably, a lot of people get scared and say, well, uh, so you are just going to post uh, participants' uh, data, which they give to you as a researcher for anyone on the internet to find. And that is, of course, a valid concern. So fair data is something that is both kind of more specific in what we actually mean when we say we need to make the data available. And it sounds less scary than open data. So what does this mean? So fair, uh, findable means that the data can be found, quite obvious. <laughs> so um, this means first that it has a persistent identifier. So if you link to it, then you click on the link and you actually get to that and not to some broken link. And again, uh, for example, you can get a DOI either through the Open Science Framework or Zotero, or I think there are also some other ways to get that. But it's not enough to be able to find the spreadsheet uh, which contains the data. You also need to know what it is. So rather than just having some spreadsheets uh, floating around on the internet and nobody even knows where the data came from, it's important also to have metadata. So some data about this data that tell, that, that explain, for example, what experiment it was from or what, um, what variables, uh, each column is. So that's the findable part so far, so good. Accessible means that it should be legible in a format that is legible. And that means both for humans and for machines. So um, for humans, it should be kind of in a format that's uh, uh, relatively intuitive. For machines, uh, it should be in a program that the computer, for example, can open. So, for example, if we have brain imaging data, there are normally a lot of files associated with it. And often it's stored in very exotic formats. Uh, so, um, it is important to have a structure there that is kind of intuitive. I think there are by now some guidelines for doing reproducible brain imaging studies where it really specifies a folder structure that you, where you need to have, for example, this kind of file here uh, and the information about the participants there and the metadata here in that format. So this will really allow uh, somebody to write a script, which will just automatically access the available, uh, open, openly available data from a particular platform and to combine them in analysis as they like. For accessibility, it's also important to use uh, open source software. So again, uh, as you can tell, I really don't like SPSS. So if you have uh, data or some file stored in a format that people can only open if they have a very expensive software that's not, that's not accessible. So that doesn't meet the FAIR standards. Interoperable means that, uh, well, the metadata, which you already need to include for, for it to be findable, 
needs to be also sufficient for people to be able to work with the data. So for example, the column labels need to be either very clear or there needs to be an additional readme file which explains what each column label means. Because even if you know where the data comes from, but you have no idea what the data actually is, what each column is, that doesn't really help you with anything. And it needs to be reusable, which means that there needs, it needs to be clear who can use the data under what conditions. And this is where you uh, have to choose a license, which is uh, the most tricky part. I think there was a question about that um, in the uh, in the in the Etherpad, or somebody said that they would be interested to learn more about that. So um, it is up to the person who uploads the data with which license they attach to it. Um, and uh, I'm not an expert on that, but I think the um, possibilities are the same as for anything else. So I think in the open science community, most people would use the um, uh, by attribution license that people can reuse it as long as they cite you. And then you can also specify whether you are fine with uh, it being used for commercial purposes, etc. So the question that everybody has uh, about uh, well, making data openly available, especially when we talk about um, uh, human participants, is what about privacy? So I'm a psychologist myself, so I work with uh, hum human data all the time. But luckily, my data looks something like this. So this is actually uh, some, some raw data of mine that I uploaded to um, the Open Science Framework. Um, I'm a cognitive psychologist, so I don't really ask any personal questions about people's psychological well-being or sexual orientation. I ask them about their age. So, um, well, technically I ask them about their date of birth, but the date of birth is already a, a piece of information that is uh, uh, pers like personally, that can be used for personal identification. But actually I don't care about their date of birth because uh, in this case I tested some adults and I care about their age because I think that might uh, act as a covariate. So when I upload the data, instead of putting the date of birth, I put the more anonymous version of just their age. There, is, there isn't any column with the date during which they performed the test. So you really can't tell very much just by knowing how many year, uh, how, how old they are in years. And then there are some reading tasks. Uh, so there's calls on some reading tasks, some uh, experimental tasks. So this kind of data is perfectly fine to upload as long as the participants give their consent for that. So with privacy, I should also give the disclaimer that I'm not an expert. So if you are working with uh, data, with uh, uh, human participants data, uh, chances are that your department has some kind of uh, privacy officer. So uh, if you have any questions, they are the go-to person because they will be able to give you more legally binding answers. So this is just things that I found out and apply in my own research. So the first question is, um, does your data contain any personal or sensitive information? So personal information, uh, I have been uh, told it's the kind of information that we can find in, in a person's passport. So things like their name, address, date of birth, place of birth. So this already should not be made public. With qualitative data, there have been a couple of people who have already uh, expressed interest in that. Um, this is something like interviews, for example. This is, of course, a big issue because if uh, people, uh, 
for example, in an interview say uh, that they were at a particular time at a particular place, then that is already something that can be used to identify them. If any of you are in uh, psychology, biology, you uh, collect brain imaging data or any kind of biometric data. That is also that something that uh, even though if you look at a brain scan, you can't tell who it's from. But it is theoretically possible to write some, some fancy machine learning algorithm that would be able to backtrace the identity of the person. So that's also something that you should be very careful with. And then, of course, sensitive information. If you collect clinical information about people's uh, diagnoses and health or uh, things like sexual or orientation, things that you wouldn't want uh, everybody to know about you, um, these, are all, this, these are all pieces of data that you should be very careful with. So uh, as a rule, they should not be, not ever be published uh, and if you have any concerns or questions, then uh, maybe you can check with the data officer at your university. If you don't have any personal or sensitive data, then as a general rule, it is okay to publish it. But you need to make sure that the participants give their informed consent for this. So when you give them the information and consent form to sign, it should also include some information that their data will be, their raw data will be published. Their raw anonymized data will be published. And you also need to check that this is fine with the ethics committee and funding agency. Uh, because normally when you write an ethics application before you do an experiment or when you ask for funding, you need to have some kind of data management plan. And a lot of people, uh, for some reason, promise to de delete their data or destroy their data after 10 years. And if you promise that you do that, then you, of, co of course, have to do that. But I think in many cases it's because of a misunderstanding because for example, the um, German Research Foundation, the DFG, requires that people keep the data, that the researcher keeps the data for 10 years. So people uh, interpret that as saying, as, as, as meaning that they have to destroy it after 10 years, which is actually not the case. So overall, um, I would summarize this section by saying that privacy always trumps open science. So you should never ever compromise your participants um, privacy in the name of open science because for many reasons that will backfire against you very badly. But there are many things that uh, we can uh, make openly available. So like in the example above here, um, the date of birth would not be okay to publish, but if we calculate the age of the participants, then it's already fine. So a lot of the time it is possible to, um, uh, to put up some data and to share already a lot of information. Okay, so that is the end of the fair data section. There is actually less discussion than I kind of expected. So, yes, this question too is about pre-registration, uh, which I think the, 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 that was, I think the, the remaining topics had the same number of people who were interested, like one or two. So, uh, maybe are there any questions or comments about uh, data? Then out of the, uh, I'll just quickly check what the remaining topics are. So we have registered reports still left and open access. My guess is that open access is going to be more broadly applicable to everyone. So, uh, 
maybe I will quickly create a poll because I think we will have time for one more topic. Uh, or maybe actually rather than me going into the poll, ah, somebody is typing a question. Are there any resources for legal requirements of open access databases? Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind spontaneously is the um, uh, cent, um, LMU Open Science Center, American spelling, I think. Uh, they uh, have some resources uh, also about open access. Uh, uh, can you see my browser now? Good, yes, I'm pretty sure it's somewhere here. Yes, so yeah, it's maybe I will post a link to this whole page. Um, so th th there is some uh, information here about open data and open materials. Uh, I will just copy paste this link. I'm not sure how much it talks about legal requirements. Uh, so legal requirements from whose side in terms of privacy? In terms of who can share what? So how close it can be to content behind a paywall using identifiers of established databases. So um, you mean like... Um, Maybe it's easier if I quickly explain what I mean instead of just <laughs> trying to type as fast as possible. Um, so I'm, I'm looking to build up a database for manually um, extracted data. Um, the problem is that the least we need is a, an ad identifier for companies. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, the identifiers which I use uh, typically belong to specific um, databases which you have to have um, I don't know, uh, a submission, uh, subscription to something, something like that. So we were thinking that even if we use uh, the IDs that they provide, that kind of uses content, which you normally would have to pay for. Um, mm -hmm. Do you, do you have any, any advice in this regard? Oh, um, Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> not something that I'm very familiar with. So in, in uh, as a general rule, the copyright holder can determine the conditions for the reuse. So it's, it's um, I mean, my, <laughs> uh, what I would suggest would be to try and talk to them directly because Maybe they will be fine with with having their information used for research purposes, and maybe they will just want money. So, um, so it's difficult to say, though. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's. I hope it <laughs> is, of course, not a not a. Uh, very specific answer, but maybe at least a bit helpful. Good, so, um, yes. Um, are there any other questions or comments? 
So maybe in the Etherpad, um, I will just post the link in the chat again. Uh, people got, can just quickly indicate if they would prefer to hear about, um, I will write that as a question. What would you like to hear about in the last 15 minutes? Uh, if you would like to hear about open access, uh, please write an X or something after access. That's not how you spell it. After open access, and if you would like to hear about registered reports, please write an X after registered reports. So the slides will be available. So either way, you will be able to uh, access them. Ha, huh, so far it's <laughs> an even split. So if somebody is uh, still thinking about whether they should write something at all or not, you can be the tiebreaker. Yeah, actually, I think there should be a recording of me doing a talk about registered reports. That's the good thing about things being online. Um, so maybe I will talk about open access. Is that fine? And um, and then I can, oh, it's reloading for some reason. Uh, then I can um, post the link somehow to the uh, 20 minute talk about uh, registered reports. So I think I can go to open access directly. So in the workshops that I do for, uh, well, uh, uh, that I do live, I have this slide as an attention check. So I, uh, well, uh, this is a screenshot uh, of a random uh, journal article. And um, you can see here that if I want to read it, I need to buy the PDF for 37 euros. This is called a paywall. So you try to access a paper and, um, you can't because you need to pay for it because your library, your university library doesn't have a sub subscription. So uh, as an attention check in workshops, I like to ask who has uh, seen this before, who has come across a paywall before. And then if people don't uh, all raise their hands, I can kind of say, you know, wake up. <laughs> and um, everybody who has had some contact with academia has come across this problem before that you find an article which sounds really relevant to what you are doing you really want to read it but you can't because you would need to pay so this is a bit problematic so uh, i would like to first explain kind of the the principle behind why we have these paywalls and this is a landscape that is rapidly changing so uh, i prepared this slide at the beginning of the year uh, already there are some uh, advancements with uh, Plan S, uh, which honestly I haven't been keeping up to date with that. Um, so this is kind of the uh, state uh, from, well, early this year. So there are some traditional journals, uh, the, the way that the publication system has always worked. The journals or the publishers get the money from library subscriptions. So libraries give monies to the publisher and the publisher uses that money for many things, including running the journal. When an author publishes a paper, they, uh, well, they do the work, they do the research, they write the paper, and then they have to give up the copyright to the articles. So they give the copyright to the journals or to the publishers. And nobody can access the paper unless they 
have uh, access to um, a library which is paying the subscription fees. So that's the traditional system. Uh, there has been a lot of criticism of this, of this system, as I'm sure all of you are aware. And these same traditional journals came up with a hybrid open access uh, model. So they uh, sell it as open access, but basically what they do is it's, it's the very same journals for which the libraries pay a subscription fee. And they say that, okay, if the authors pay an open access publication fee, typically over 1,000 euros and typically well over 1,000 euros, then they generously allow the authors to keep the copyright and they publish it open access so that anyone can uh, click on, on the PDF and download it. So the thing is though that uh, the libraries uh, still pay the subscription fees. So I think the, there is some kind of offset because they pay for the journal, right? So, and the open access paper is published in the journal for which the libraries pay. And I think there is some offset, so they pay a little bit less, but I think it's, it's very untransparent how it's actually calculated and probably does not really compensate for um, the articles that are open access in that journal that the libraries pay for. So in a way it's an even worse system because um, the taxpayers first pay for the researcher to do the research, then they pay for the libraries to pay to the journals, and then they pay to the researchers so that they can pay the open access publication fees, and only then do they generally have access to the paper which they funded in the first place. So this is not a good system. The two alternative routes are gold open access and green open access. So gold open access, these are completely different journals, so a different set of journals which have a completely different business model. So rather than being sustained by uh, journals, by library sub subscription fees, uh, these uh, journals charge the author for each publication. So um, the authors pay a publication fee. Uh, well, I wrote over 700 euros. I think if you find some really cheap ones, you can go down to 500 or so. And uh, again, it can be several thousands. But from the very beginning, every paper in this journal is open access, so everyone can uh, read it, everyone can read the PDF, and the authors retain the copyright for it so they can distribute it as they like. The two things that are sometimes criticized about this model, the first one is that the business model actually makes it advantageous if they publish as many things as possible so that means they have the um, incentive to publish as many things as possible, even if it's not good quality research. Uh, so one uh, journal or series of journals, well, a publisher <laughs> uh, who falls in, under this category is uh, Frontiers, which is very controversial because at the beginning, everybody in the open science community was like, yay, an open access journal. But then they started publishing some things that really should not have gone past peer review, including some some randomized, well, some badly conducted randomized control trials about homeopathy and uh, things like this. So they have lost a lot of their credibility. The other related aspect is the uh, problem with predatory journals, which are journals that publish things without peer review. So they supposedly have peer review, but then you can, a couple of people have tried sending, for example, randomly generated text. Um, these predatory journals often uh, market very aggressively. So uh, any of you who has a university email account definitely gets a lot of emails from them, you know, from a field that is that has nothing to do with your research. Uh, we want to publish your your esteemed research or yeah so uh, i guess all of you will know what i'm talking about 
So this is a bit of a red herring, I think, because um, people who don't like open access always keep on talking about how it just leads to these predatory publishers. And uh, that's why open access is bad, which of course is a really big setback for the open science movement. And actually it's, in my view, a completely orthogonal problem because they are just using this, these predatory, uh, the, the, the problem is not that they are open access, these predatory journals, but rather that they don't offer peer review, which has nothing to do with open science. So this uh, last route is green open access, where actually you can use any of these journals. You can publish your paper anywhere, and then you just upload a preprint. So a preprint is a version of your paper. Well, uh, there are some confusion with definitions. So uh, the narrow definition is that the, the preprint is the version of your paper as it is when you first submit it to the journal, so before peer review. Officially, then after it goes through peer review, it becomes a postprint. So if it's the unformatted version of the article, so if the journal eventually says, okay, we will publish this, and um, then the journal, of course, does some formatting. So you can often also upload the postprint, which is the version of the paper, when the journal agrees to publish it, but that does not have the formatting of the journal. So, uh, but collectively, I refer to preprints and postprints as preprint, preprints. Um, yes, many, uh, uh, I will get to that later. Uh, there is a question in the chat. So um, there is a website, this Sherpa Romeo, I think on the next slide, I also have a link to that, where you can look up your journal and it, uh, most journals, even the uh, traditional ones, allow you to uh, publish uh, either a preprint or a postprint or whatever you like, but normally not the final formatted version. So there are different um, uh, pages on which you can uh, publish uh, op uh, on which you can publish preprints. Preprints. The Open Science Framework is a, a very general one. Uh, from my own field, there is Sci Archive, so for psychology papers. The original preprint server is Archive, which is uh, mainly physics. And basically, no matter what your field is, you can probably search for preprint server and then the name of your field and you will probably find something. But otherwise, OSF is, is very, uh, well, it's, it's, it's not area specific. I wrote ResearchGate, if you must, and uh, somebody has already written in the chat what's wrong with ResearchGate. ResearchGate is not very respected in the open science community uh, because it's a commercial page. It is not open access and uh, theoretically any time they might uh, decide that they want to start charging and uh, in that case uh, all of the preprints that have been uploaded on ResearchGate would just disappear. Um, I use ResearchGate myself so I don't like it personally but um, it is something that definitely does the job of getting your research out there just because at least in my field everybody uses it. But I also use the open science framework because so I <laughs> upload my preprints twice which actually is a bit messy but uh, that's a different issue. Um, Follow-up question, uh, many articles uploaded on ResearchGate are uh, in the version that it's published. Uh, I see it's already five o'clock. Um, so I think I will finish with this slide and then we can wrap up if that's fine. So um, 
Yes, so most of the time it's not fine to upload the uh, version as it is published. It depends on the journal, but uh, if, you, if you do this, then you might uh, get an email. Or I think actually ResearchGate gets into trouble, but they send you a warning if you do this. <laughs> okay, so are there any other questions? Yes, so um, then uh, you, well, the slides will be available, so you will also be able to check out the, the link to the uh, information that um, I didn't have time to cover. So thank you very much for uh, attending and um, yeah, I hope that at one of the uh, fellow events, they will take place in person and I might meet some of you. So um, I will stop recording. Uh, if I can figure out how. So.